This is Booked on Rock. I'm Eric Senich. Our guest is Mike Errico, author of Music, Lyrics, and Life, a field guide for the advancing songwriter. That's How It Ends, from New York singer-songwriter Mike Errico, from his 2007 studio album All In. It's one of several albums released by Errico, who has also just released a book titled Music, Lyrics, and Life. This is the songwriting class you always wish you'd taken, taught by the professor you always wish you'd had. It's a deep dive into the heart of questions asked by songwriters of all levels, from how to begin journaling to when you know that a song is finished. With humor and empathy, Erico unravels both the mystery of songwriting and the logistics of life as a songwriter. Alongside his own lessons, Erico interviews the writers, producers, and A&R executives behind today's biggest hits and investigates the larger questions of creativity through lively conversations with a wide range of innovative thinkers. The result is that music, lyrics, and life ends up revealing as much about the art of songwriting as it does about who we are and where we may be going. New York-based recording artist, writer, and lecturing professor Mike Errico has built his name on the strength of critically acclaimed releases and extensive composition for film and TV. He teaches songwriting at universities, including Yale, Wesleyan, The New School, and NYU's Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music. In addition to his performing and teaching careers, Errico's opinions and insights have appeared in publications including The New York Times, CNN, The Wall Street Journal, Fast Company, and The Observer. To hear a playlist of the music discussed in this episode, just head over to the show notes page. If you don't believe, then it's time for you to leave. Hi, Mike. Thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. I was so fascinated with this book. I told you before we started recording that I can't write a song to save my life. And <laughs> and your response was, well, you never know. So maybe uh, yeah, you can you teach me a thing or two here. But th- I think that's why I'm such a fan of music, because I can dabble here and there, maybe play a little of this, a little of that. But I'm fascinated with how musicians write songs. It's one of the greatest gifts that you can have. Yeah, it's super crazy. It's a weird mix of sort of being in the moment and then also just having a set of tools at your disposal. Well, let's get a little background on you before we get into the book. I love how this book opens you, right? Quote, I was born backward, literally. It's called a Frank Breach Birth, which is doctor talk for ass first. (laughs) The, the, The joke is that I never quite turned around and there's some evidence to support that. Can you give us a quick bio of yourself and how, as you write, backed into songwriting and eventually backed into this book? Well, my origin story is exactly what I just wrote. I was born backward and I backed into songwriting because my dad was a classical pianist and he decided to take a pop songwriting course and he hated it because he was like all into Debussy and Chopin and everything else. And he hated it, but he didn't want to get his money back, right? Because he he felt that he would look cheap or whatever. So we have the same name. And so I just went in his place. And like the the, the, uh, teacher the next day was like, oh, wow, you look um, different, you know? (laughs) So then that's how I started writing songs and went on to, I've had a couple of different record deals. I've written for television and film and done all these different things as far as writing is concerned. And then while I was on the road, I got a call from the dean of a college to talk to some students. And I was like, man, I don't know how to do that. And he booked me anyway. And now I've been teaching. So I've been teaching since like 2013. Wow. So you backed Um, into that as well. Yeah. and, And then I backed into the book because then I was like, okay, well, if I'm teaching, I need to assign something. And I looked around, I read tons and tons of songwriting books. I was like, ah, you know, the one I want doesn't exist. (laughs) So I was like, well, yeah, I'm going to have to write it. And you did. did. And it's a fascinating book. So you're, you're, you live in Brooklyn, New York right now. Is that where you're from? Were you born and raised in New York? I was born here. We were here for some of the time, moved out to Long Island for a stretch. And I basically moved right back. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Not very nomadic. 
Hey, New York's the place to be, though, right? I mean, I suppose, yeah, yeah. Can't beat it. Okay, so you said you've written for film and you've had some record deals. Can you give us mm-hmm. a, a little bit of uh, info on that? I mean, any movies that we'd be familiar with, and um, record deals, how did that all play out? You As a solo artist in a band, how did that? Well, my first deal was on a sire label called Hybrid at the time. I think they had folded. So I went into that. And I moved into a whole bunch of different songwriting avenues just because I've always had a really wide taste for music. One of my first things I was thinking was like, maybe I'll be a session guitarist because every day it's a different style, you know? So I got into TV for a while. I wrote some TV themes like pop-up video, if you're familiar with it, on VH1. Oh, absolutely. You wrote that theme song? Yeah, that's me. That's the one that I guess everybody knows. I've done a bunch of other types of things like that and just decided based on my love of Ani DeFranco, who is kind of a star for me, I decided to bring in my own work and fund it myself and be independent. So I made records and then licensed them. So then I had another label deal with a label called Velour and the, they had bands like Soul Live or Lettuce or bands that are sort of like jazz oriented, like jam band type stuff. I was one of the first acts that actually had vocals on it. They were doing like trios, like jazz trios and like, you know, that were in the jam band world. Soul Live is really the big one. Lettuce I have heard of. I know they've gotten some airplay on um, Sirius right. XM on the jam, jam band station. Right. Well, Lettuce is Eric Krasno, and Eric Krasno was the head of Soul Life. He was the guitarist in Soul Life. Okay. So they're all, you know, interrelated. Anyway, so I toured with those guys and did that kind of stuff for a while. What yeah. bands did you listen to growing up? What were your favorite bands, favorite artists, favorite songwriters growing up? It's funny because, like, pop music is not really, like, something that I listen to as a listener. So, like, I, I feel like the... The album that blows my mind, the first one that comes to mind is Animals by Pink Floyd. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, because it's very spacey and and it's creepy. It's a trip, you know, it's an actual journey. That's the one that doesn't get a lot of notice because it didn't have any singles on there. Right. But amazing. And the guitar playing, I mean, Dave Gilmore, it's got to be one of my favorite guitar players ever. And just the idea that music is really creepy and is also a destination that got me really excited about music there was a lot of guitar based stuff so anything with a guitar was cool so jazz with a guitar was cool country with a guitar was cool metal with a guitar was cool the cure or new wave or 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 that kind of music 80s music 90s music great guitar is really the thing that was moving (laughs) was moving me through a lot of it cure is in my top 10 love the cure yeah yeah so just following the guitar was really what i got into what was the first song you ever wrote i didn't write a song until much later like i was out of college by the time and i think it's because i had like a real self-esteem problem and i think that's maybe why teaching is so important to me because i really never had the i never had the confidence that anyone would want to hear me so i thought I really want to play, so I'll, I'll be a session person or a background or sideman, that kind of thing. So I did a bunch of years as a sideman for a bunch of different bands. And then I listened and learned from front people what works, what doesn't work, what parts of a song are actually sort of dead air as opposed to like, you know, the, the important stuff. And, you know, I basically learned on stage behind other songwriters. And then I stepped out. Do you remember the first song you wrote? Probably it would be like, there was a song called I Don't Get It. And I think that was that was the first one. And it was written on the same day as I wrote another one called If I Were the Pope, <laughs> which, was, which was a love song, basically. And it was like, you know, if I were the Pope, we wouldn't be able to hook up. You know? <laughs> oh, that's great. I love it. You know? I love it. Did you, and, ever, did yeah. you record it? Yeah. And, and the twist, of course, on the end is like, wow, I'm really glad I'm not the Pope. Oh, that's um, awesome. Which was, I mean, you know, first songs, you know. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) 
So in the book, you list all of the songwriting questions. <clears throat> what is success? What is a hit? What is yeah. a song? Why am I doing this? And ultimately, who am I and how can I live with whoever that reveals itself to be? And you follow yeah. that by saying, if your songs aren't asking them of you, chances are good they aren't asking them of your listeners. Can you expand on that? Well, the first part of that is I try to tell my students that they need to define success for themselves or it will be defined for them. And once someone else is defining what success is for you, you are basically beholden to them, right? They are controlling what you think your value is and what your worth is. And in music, that is super dangerous. And every semester I've taught, someone has really has taken their life or died as a result of the life somehow, somehow related to the life. People you would think are, are incredibly successful, but, you know, but something got into their, something else got into their heads, you know, and, and I worry for, I worry for my students. Like, I don't want them to be jerked around by that. So asking them to define success for themselves is actually a way of getting them to defend themselves and arm them for an industry that's real fickle, you know? So sometimes when people do that and they define success for themselves, they realize, oh, damn, I'm not a songwriter. I don't even like this. I was just here to make my parents mad. And what I really want to be is an architect or a this or a that or whatever. And if people find out in my classes that they don't want to be a songwriter, that is a huge win for me. I find that as a, a huge success because they're finding out what they want to be, you know, I played a show on Friday and someone was like, someone came up to me like, thank you for the recommendation for law school. And I was like, go with God, man. You know, like, go do your thing. Songwriting is not for everybody, but the skills are really transferable. And so that's what the book tries to do is try to give these transferable skills, which is also why I don't talk to exclusively to musicians, you know, so that I can get sort of transferable skills across to whoever's reading it. So that's whoever it reveals itself to be. I do think that if you're not taking chances in the writing, people recognize that and they, they realize it. So what I meant by like, if, if you're not asking big questions of yourself, people feel it. They, they feel when you're phoning it in. They feel when you're on autopilot. And they also feel like when you're really going for it. So th that's sort of what I meant by that. I always want them to be like challenging the audience and challenging themselves as far as voice goes. But I also think that it's really cool to keep the form tight. That's something you're, I'm watching right now, just at present. I'm watching the uh, Beatles documentary, Get Ooh, Back. I was going to get to that. Plus. I was going to yeah. get to that. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> I mean, you know, that's fascinating because that's, you're, you're right there. You're watching them as they're creating these songs. Yeah. And that's fascinating. And it's also hilarious to have the perspective that we have because we know that they don't know what they're coming up with. That they don't, they have no idea what the song that they're writing will eventually become. But we do know that. So, like, when they're doing Maxwell Silver Hammer or whatever, and like somebody's banging on an anvil, they're like, oh, this is cute. And we're thinking, like, this song is going to be a standard in 50, 60 years or whatever. Do you know that Peter Jackson wants to release, there's like 18 hours, mm -hmm. and he wants to release the full 18-hour version. Like the one we see now, Paul probably said, it's a great idea, but let's, because Peter Jackson's known for having very, yeah. very long movies. Yeah. And so I think he really wanted to, he wanted that full version. And Paul said, no, yeah, that's a little too much. But he plans on putting that whole thing out. So what else is yeah. in there, you know? What I heard about it is like, there's something so cool about it being so long because you get the tedium of what it's like to write also. Because you're banging around, bad idea, bad idea, bad idea. Then all of a sudden something massive shows up. It doesn't just show up, you know what I mean? And in that, in the documentary, you really get all the garbage and the toast and like who's late and who needs a tea and who needs a cigarette and whatever. And you almost get a, you just get a sense of how rare the really great ideas are. You know? What did you think of as a songwriter? How would you be if you see Yoko sitting there not making 
really any any facial expressions. It's, it's yeah. almost like it kind of sucks the air out of the room. Like, is she really? Is she digging this? She she likes some yeah. of the blues stuff, the bluesy stuff. She liked, but she was literally looked like she was just knitting at one point. And these guys are. Yeah. Th- this is the Beatles, you know. They're right. I know. <laughs> it's the freaking Beatles, you know. I and, know. And they're they're writing these amazing songs, and you see them all bouncing ideas off of each other. I would be sitting there like jaw dropped, but I, I guess that speaks to there was always. People wondered if it was Yoko uh, BSing when she says, I didn't know who the Beatles were when I met John and I didn't. And I don't, it doesn't seem like she was all that impressed. Yeah. I mean, I, I read recently an article about like, she, you know, she was, what she was really doing was staging some sort of performance art piece or something like that. I, I just, and, you know, John invited her in. Paul said, okay. George is there. Ringo's there. You know, so whatever works, I suppose, you know, and everyone's got challenges, right? Every band has challenges. I just feel like she does look bored. And I'm like thinking like, well, if you're bored, do go do something else. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but, but that's completely personal. You know, that has nothing to do with like, maybe John needed her there. Yeah. Right. And maybe Paul needed John. Therefore, Paul needed Joe going to be there. You know. Well, that's, so, that's one thing. They all seem to be pretty cool. With it, it wasn't like you read these things about Paul just not wanting her there at all. And he he was cool with her. I mean, they weren't. They didn't. Nobody. I mean, they they were so established as songwriters at that point. I can't imagine they were self conscious and wondering, yeah. does she like this? Does she like this? I just thought if I'm there, I'm looking over. You want that vibe? You want everybody to be digging and totally. digging on what you're doing, but. Glenn, totally. John, Glenn Johns was pretty quiet too. The the producer, or uh, he was. I'm sorry, engineer. He was the engineer. engineer. Yeah. He, he was pretty funny. And then you get like the occasional glance over at Alan Parsons or whoever you know, who's like running the tape machine and will eventually do Dark Side of the Moon. You know what I mean? But Mind like, blowing. Th- yeah, there he is, like just running the tape machine. That's just really funny. But getting back to so what I was asking now, what if you have somebody who comes into your class and they want to be a songwriter because they want to be rich and they want to be maybe famous too, but songwriters sometimes can be behind the scenes, but I want to make a lot of money. You shouldn't right. do it. You should not do anything like this for the money. Right. I mean, I do this, no. I do this podcast and if I had five listeners per week, I, I would still do it because I just love it. You know, so absolutely. So I, I, w- I would, do you warn somebody say, hold on, be very careful with what you're saying, because if you're going to do this for the money, you may not, you know, you got to do this. Yeah. I love it. Right. But, you know, there was one moment where a student thought he was being, you know, snarky or funny or whatever, but it was really telling. He said, how good do my songs have to be for me to launch my shoe line? I was like, dude, (laughs) I I get where you're going. I, I have to tell you, you should just simply launch your shoe line. This is not where the big money is going to be. And, you know, especially if you're strictly a songwriter, which is different than being a performing artist, because there's so many different revenue streams for performing artists than there are for songwriters. So if you're in the songwriting for the money, I don't even think you know what the job is, you know, let alone to be deluded by it, you know. That just speaks to the younger generation, though. That's how they're thinking. I want to sell perfume, sneakers, cologne, Whatever. Yes. You know, how do I yeah. get there? How do I do that? How do I put my name on on this? Right. I mean, there is a lot. There is a lot to that. There's a lot about branding, and a, a lot about. But it really comes the other way. And my class is a little bit different because it's like a lot of it has to do with I don't think I can write that type of song because it doesn't fit with my brand, right? Which is a weird sort of limitation to put on yourself as a writer, especially early in what you're doing when you don't know what you're brand is going to be i try and push writers into like write a parody song write a country song write a this kind of you know different types of songs because i want them to find what their thing is especially the ones who think they already know chances are they don't and there are lots of different transformations that occur like the person who was like mr serious or whatever turns out is actually a parody songwriter like a bo burnham or like someone is really pushing hip hop, but is like just a real pop singer. Watching that kind of stuff happen and watching them let go of what their preconceptions of what like a brand is for them is so much part of what the book is about. It's so much part of what my class is about. 
Yeah, I think as a fan, I can pick up too when the artist, it's coming from the heart. It's something that's sincere and honest because I remember one time going to see the singer of the the Spin Doctors, Chris Barron. He played here in Connecticut one night in front of, it was this little tiny, tiny club. It was just him and his acoustic guitar. And he was up there in front of like 20 people. He was loving it though. I mean, he was yeah. he was loving. He was talking about how these songs came about, and what inspired them, and he was into it every bit as much as like fifteen twenty years ago when he was playing on big stages when they were Spin Doctors were the biggest band of the time. And I loved that because I could tell this guy it really didn't matter. I always wondered how these artists think when they they're on the cover of Rolling Stone and they got this huge album and then their career takes a hit. You know, and it happens to a lot of them. And and are they yep. bummed out? What's going through their minds? And you realize that, I don't know, I think all of it just kind of falls by the wayside when they're just sitting there performing music, writing a song. They just love it so much. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter how many people I, are there. I have a great one. I opened in a small room for Colin Hay. Yeah, Men the, at Work. Uh, yeah, lead singer of Men at Work. Arguably, like, uh, one of the biggest bands. Like, they were unstoppable. For a short while, they were humongous. And he was playing it was a small room in philadelphia he was the nicest guy ever loved every second of the set and then had a couple more hits like we're talking about like in the 2010s you know what i mean he's still beloved because when he plays he just he just loves it he has an acoustic version of who can it be now that's even gotten play on some television shows and on netflix and he's doing great on sync and on like film things and like and it's just because he's a great guy and he's got like that. He's got that whole background of, of himself. He was, I swear to God, it was like 20 people in the room, like you said. And he was talking about what it's like to play Wembley, basically, like wow. as a headliner. You know, you know what I mean? And like he was, but he was totally cool about it. Doing something you love, it just doesn't matter how many people are, you, are listening. If you yes. connect with one person, I mean, that's a beautiful thing. And I know, but then you get to the business side of things, just like, you know, you just yeah. mentioned about people to get eaten up by the business side of things. The record labels, they don't want to hear you say as long as I connect with one person. They want you to connect with no. millions. Blues Traveler, another one of my favorite mm-hmm. bands. And I remember on VH1's Behind the Music on Blues Traveler, they were just pounded on John Popper to write another runaround. We need another right. runaround. Like the whole the next album was done. We need another mm-hmm. runaround. He's like, fine, here it is. And he wrote most mm-hmm. most precarious. How do you feel about that as an artist? Do you should he have done that? Because some artists would say, I'm not giving you another song that sounds just like that one. I don't care what you say. What would you do in that situation if the label tells you that? I want something exactly like that hit song you wrote on the last album. It's impossible to get into his head. But I think when you get up into that area, you're writing and you're writing for yourself. You can see the pressure going lots of different directions. And I'm thinking about Tom Petty going back out on the road when he probably shouldn't have because there were so many other mouths to feed beside his own, you know? He had, like, the whole crew and the band and the lighting people and the booking and everything else. So there are pressures like that. So if Popper was thinking that way, he's maybe thinking larger than himself and maybe even getting that stuff out in front of the art. And that becomes a dangerous dance, as I I think you're implying. It could also be, like, a really great challenge, though, you know? It could have worked out great. And I think you do see that in the Get Back documentary where Paul and John are pushing each other. They're giving each other artistic pressure, and I think they're better for it. The Booked on Rock podcast will return after this. When you teach, you touch on four main themes. This is what you write in your book, and you weave them through pretty much everything. What are those four big ideas, you call them? What are the four big ideas? I do have these four different themes. The first is journaling. Journaling to me is really important. I've had a bunch of singer-songwriters and writers, big writers, producers, etc. They're all journalers of some sort. You know, they, they all are documenting their ideas in some way. In my class, I make them do longhand three pages a day, which is something I got from a book called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. And I want them to do longhand for a couple of different reasons. But if they're journaling in any way, that's a huge win. Because I feel like music itself is so evanescent. 
that you have to live a little bit like a fireman, you know, like a firefighter. When the inspiration comes, you kind of have to drop everything because it leaves as quickly as it shows up. Journaling is a great way to catch those things. In the book, I talk all the way down to Meek Mill, who's a rapper. And, and basically, he's like, I don't journal at all. When I have an idea, I run to the microphone and hit the red light. That's the journal. The finished song is my journal, you know, but it's still a journal. There are others in the book, like Eric Bazilian, who wrote One of Us by Joan Osborne, and he's in the Hooters, and he's written and worked with Cindy Lauper and many, many others. He has a thing called Riff Du Jour, which he basically plays every morning, waits for something to strike him, then he records that. So that's a different type of journaling. That's a really big one because the way you really innovate, I, I believe, in songwriting is through the voice and not through the form, right? So like, you'll have a song with a chorus and everybody's got a song with a chorus, but it's what you're saying in the chorus that is the thing that really makes you a Billie Eilish as opposed to just someone who sings and plays well, you know? So that's really the first. The second is mechanics. So what's under the hood? What makes a song a song? Why do we repeat anything, right? Why do we have choruses? Why do we have things that are almost mathematical? A songwriter like Max Martin has a term, melodic math, which goes back centuries, but it just talks about and illustrates a mechanic sort of quality towards the architecture of a song. Not to mention the Beatles again, but they are really tight as far as form goes. But so is Billie Eilish. So is Olivia Rodrigo. So is Nirvana. So is a lot of these pop people who have popular songs. They have forms that are in conversation with each other. Number three is mentoring the experience of people who've done it before you and have wisdom you know when i have guests come in i try not to get like the old like people who have war stories because that can be really boring and not helpful that's a history class but people who are really pushing and curious and will give inspiring bits of wisdom that you can take forward what to do in certain scenarios kind of thing so I, I run that through the whole book as well. And then finally, the fourth sort of piece is, is the constantly asking why. The weirdness of never being satisfied and never stopping, right? You never get like the satisfaction of, of like a job well done. You know what I mean? It's like on to the next one, on to the next one, on to the next one right? Constantly pushing forward. And so that's the kind of thing that I, I want them to sort of feel and just get a grip on. Because if you understand that type of dissatisfaction, I think you get a better sense of what it is to constantly be a creative person, as opposed to like, wow, this is not working. You know what I mean? Like, I'm failing at this. Because I just feel like I never get where I'm going. The whole point is that you never get there. You never get where you're going. It's all, the whole thing is like creating a path for yourself. I think of Bruce um, Springsteen and Bob Dylan are guys who are still putting out music on a regular basis. And they always seem to be asking that question. It's incredible. It's just incredible. And that's what you want as a fan. You know what I mean? As a listener. I want to see where it's going. And, you know, you mentioned Dylan. I have friends who are going to see Dylan and they're just freaking out about all the different things he's still doing. And he's this he changed up and that he changed up and he sounds great and whatever. People like that are, are really inspiring. And you as a fan live with that artist and live with those songs. With streaming services, you know, if an artist is still churning out music a lot, they want to write music. There, oh, yeah. there's, there's not as much in financially in it as it was in the past, yet there they are still doing it. So now I ask you about Billy Joel, a mm. guy who just put it down, said, I'm not doing it anymore. What do you think mm -hmm. about Billy Joel? As a fan, I know I love Billy Joel. I wish he would have written some more music. Can you understand that? Why he would want to just put it down and not? I can because, I mean, he... It's funny, I don't think of him as putting anything down because like he's playing 
Madison Square Garden, right? Is he still? Isn't he He's, still? He doing still that? is. Yeah, but but he said I'm not. I'm. And this was a long time ago, and he stuck to that promise. I'm not writing any more new music. No more pop songs. He did some yeah. classical music, I believe, but no more pop songs. No more pop yeah. rock songs or whatever you want to call it. But it just well, he just kind of, felt like there was no more need to do it. Which I I was I, I'm always surprised to hear that. I you mean, think he'd want to? Maybe he is. He's just not putting it out. Yeah, I thought you were going to say maybe he really is the piano man. You know, what I mean? yeah. <laughs> he, you know, like he's playing the songs, he's playing the hits. You yeah. know, God knows what he does in his own time. But that classical album was really telling. I thought, you know, he might be just bored or just dried out from it. You know, and 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 wanting to explore something else. But he realizes that. That's not what people are coming to Madison Square Garden for. And maybe that's not what they really want. I, as a fan, as long as he's not making music because he just doesn't want to, that's cool. I, I would hate yeah. to see somebody just saying, I don't want to make music and put it out there because people are just going to trash it. And I, I would hate to see that. My favorite band is Van Halen. And I know after oh. Van Halen 3 in 1998, the story is that Eddie took, he really took that hard. Like People just criticized. That was the first album that he ever had where, the critics were mm-hmm. all over it. And mm-hmm. there were some that just said he, he didn't want to, why bother? And, I, and that, that breaks my heart because if that's the case, because he was making music all the time there at his studio and he just didn't put it out because maybe he thought mm-hmm. people are just going to hate it. So why bother? And I, that would, that would suck as a fan, you know? Yeah. And oh my God, I mean, I'm sure you know this, but like there are lots of tapes and they're uncataloged. Yeah. Like yeah. nobody knows what's on them. Right. There's like two people who know what's on. So who's to say like what's going to come out? It could be like, you know, you know, you open the box and you hope it's Prince with like 12 other albums, you know, but like it could be nothing and it could be covers and it could be. I don't know, it could be schematics for more electronic inventions of his, you know, like it could be anything. What's the difference between a good song and a hit song? I mean, sometimes a good song and a hit song could be the same thing. They can go together, but sometimes not at all. Now you write a good song is a conversation between you and yourself. A hit song is a conversation between you and your fans. Everything else is just traffic. Talk about that. What makes a good song and what makes a hit song? And what's the difference? A good song, the, the word good is not about creation, right? The word good is about judgment, right? And I think, and from the interviews that I've had, the people who write songs really don't always know that the good songs are good. They are usually as surprised as anyone else that that a song will pop. They'll know that it resonated with them, right? But things that resonate with them might not resonate with others. So when things are really a hit, they can be as surprised as anyone else. I try to get the students away from what's a good song and just be like, there is no good and there's no bad. There's only make, just make stuff, right? Over and over and over. And what happens is the people with the most successful songs are usually the career songwriters who write a lot, right? It's a muscle, right? So like writing is a muscle and songwriting is just like going to the gym. So that's what I I feel like good is something that can be just sort of pushed away. A hit I try to define it two different ways. One, obviously a hit is like the one with the number one uh, at the top of the Billboard chart, right? Obvious. But what got a song there often has nothing to do with the song. There's so much else in there that you can't control. You know, what label are you on? Who got the most promotion? Which radio stations took it? Who are you going out with? Who killed it at the awards show? You know, that kind of stuff makes a hit as much as anything. The video is amazing, whatever, that, all that kind of stuff. What I try to tell the students is it is a conversation with your fan base. And if you are able to satisfy your fan base and increase your fan base by some amount, that's a hit. The example I use is you write a song, your mom loves it, your dad hates it. You write another song, your mom loves it again. Now your dad kind of likes this one. That's a hit, right? If that's your total fan base is your mom and your dad, you've increased your fan base, you've doubled it. So any ratio of that, any songwriter or performer would love. 
Olivia Rodrigo would love to hit a song that doubled her fan base in the yeah. same way that you just did. And a, a lot of that has to do with you can't control what everyone else is going to do, but it can really mess with you. And the idea of my students actually getting harmed by that is untenable to me. So in, in getting words, them just following that constantly moving target. Okay. Absolutely. Following a very fickle, fashiony world that is so fast, right? And is so accelerated to the point where you can actually be someone like Chris Cornell and take your life. That's not tenable. Like none of my I don't want any I don't want to ever hear that from my students. So I want them to define success for themselves, define hit for themselves, define good for themselves. Yeah. So that some crowd decides to turn their back on you because you said something weird or they like something else all of a sudden, you know, your style is out. I want them to be happy with what they're doing and be defining those kind of things for themselves. The audience can put you in a box. It can. And the popper story that you told is, is exactly that's the kind of thing. There are a lot of boxes. There are a lot of places that want to pen you in for some not great reasons. And you have to be able to withstand that. I'm thinking of another story along the lines of hit songs, whether they're intentional or unintentional. Bon Jovi living on a prayer. John Bon Jovi just didn't like the song, wanted it off the album, Slippery When Wet. And they talked right. them into putting it on there. And there you go. It's one of their most identifiable songs. It's up there with Wanted Dead or Alive. It might be their most iconic song. I mean, that yeah. their most identifiable song. True or false, most hit songs are unintentional. Some are intentional. Or is it never intentional? I mean, you could write a song with hooks and harmonies and the most current yeah. beats and sounds, right? Yeah, you. Can. I mean, you can, but there is an element of synchronicity that happens. If you, one could figure that out, so much money would be saved by record labels, right? They wouldn't take chances on anybody because they would already know how to how to write it. But the, so then the you got the guys day, like Desmond Child who wrote a lot of songs for Bon Jovi and Kiss and all these, you know, they, right. he would come up with hit songs. But the other end of it is not all of them were hits. It's funny, Desmond Child came into NYU once and he talked about that. He talked about like how many number ones he's had, how many, you know, whatever, this kind of thing, how many top 20s, top 40s, 100s, and then like how many total songs he wrote. It was like crazy number of songs. I got 800 songs or something like this. Everyone was shocked at how many number ones he actually has. I was like 800 songs. That's the number that you want to be shooting for. I mean, he works like hell. He's still putting stuff out. All those people are, are just, they're still doing it. And some things hit, some things don't. The song that I love that people talk about is uh, High and Dry by Radiohead was supposed to be on Pablo Honey, and like they were like, ah, eh, it's not that good. So And then they put it on the bends. It's like one of the all-time songs of that band. They just don't, you know, people don't, don't always know. I've seen my students blow up on TikTok, and so I know for a fact, they're like, dude, I don't know what happened. You know what I mean? It's astounding to watch. And then it goes away. I'm like, all right, it's time for like a moment of zen. You know what I mean? Like, up is nice, down is nice, stay in the middle, you know, keep making stuff. Interesting. You, know? you ask your readers to make a playlist of around 15 songs that they absolutely love, songs they wish they wrote, songs they can't live without, songs that take them back to a place in time, songs that feel like they open a door to somewhere they can't yeah. fully explain, songs they aspire to. Can you talk about the importance of this? Oh, yeah. Music is a very ineffable kind of vague, uh, you know, amorphous kind of thing. It's very hard to shoot at a target if you don't draw one. I asked the students to create a target and shoot at it. And the songs are the target. I think that those songs that they, they put on their playlists are clues to the kind of thing that they want to be doing. Like somewhere in those songs, there's the DNA of their own songs. You know, because they've listened to them however many times. And by admitting it and putting it onto a playlist, admitting what they love, they can look under the hood of those specific songs and converse, you know what I mean, with that song, have a conversation with in their own writing, with their writing. You mentioned Julia Cameron before. In the book, you talk about Julia's book, 
The Artist's Way, which is a must read. There's a great story in chapter yeah. three of your book as to how you came upon <laughs> her book. Can you tell that story and the importance of it? Yeah. So I was dating a freelance puppeteer, if you can. That's a thing. And we had this plan. She had a friend who dressed like a pirate and had a Ford Econoline van with a VW bug welded on top of it that looked like a bug, right? Like an actual bug with like legs that came off of it and went down the sides of the Econoline van and everything. It was encrusted with like jewels and toys and everything. So it was probably like seven tons, this thing, you know, because like all the stuff that was like stuck to it. He would sell frozen roaches, roaches that were frozen into ice cubes to people like just like walking around. He, he would like open the back of the van and like sell these like rubber roaches. <laughs> right. And the plan was to sell enough roaches to make it to Burning Man. OK. And I don't know what happened. Hard to say. I mean, it's such a stable sounding relationship to begin with <laughs> um, that. I don't know. They it was like they they uh, they left and they went wherever they went, you know, disappeared. The relationship blew up one night, whatever. And she left with all their stuff and she forgot a copy of The Artist's Way and a couple of rubber roaches. And I thumbed through it. And it's funny because I got to a chapter on synchronicity, which is kind of like coincidence but it's more than coincidence it's like those kind of crazy coincidences like i can't believe that just happened kind of thing and so that book showed up in the most crazy way that i had to take it seriously and i just devoured it and then i've done it a couple times since i've assigned it and it's really helped identify things that were in my way so that i could actually get on with the kind of stuff i wanted to do and I've never made it to Burning Man. And you know what? I'm the I'm not really worse off for it, yeah. I don't think. It was like you were meant to find that book. Burning Man, by the way, we're talking about this is the in place in Nevada, Burning Man. Yeah. 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 This I'm is sorry, uh, yeah. yeah, this is a, it, it, it's focused on like community art and self expression kind of thing. That's where everybody gets together and that's and, yes. You're that's a very kind, I think, way of putting it. <laughs> it's a freak out. It's a complete freak yeah. out. And I think it's worth Googling Burning Man just to see the photographs because it is the most visually stunning looking place. And it would have been great to sort of see, but you're out in the desert and I hate the sun, which is a thing. I mean, like for a studio person, right? A person who plays at night, you know, <laughs> I'm like a night person, right? So being in the desert already is a is a is a bad call also no public toilets so Oof. i don't know like you know what i mean like uh, <laughs> I, all, all we had was like you know ice and rubber roaches i'm not you know not good Oof. that's not a yeah i gotta say this might be the greatest opening to any chapter i mean that's i dated a freelance puppeteer for a couple of months period she had a friend who dressed like a pirate when i read that i'm like i've gotta i've gotta read the rest of this chapter yeah that's such a great story um, well dude first lines really important for a song too yeah well that's I, I think i even have that as one of my questions i want yeah the, the, the song's opening lyric yeah i want to ask you about that um, oh yeah but that book is not as important as the one full of blank pages, right? That's the journal, yes. chapter five, That's the a, awesome power of the daily journal. Why is this yes. the most important book you assign to songwriters? Because it's going to be filled by their own thoughts. And I think that we all just like walk around with like a cloud of stuff, like always around us. And so much passes by our minds, like as our minds stray and just sort of go about their business. When you're journaling, you're actually writing those all those things down. And if you're really paying attention to these random thoughts that are going by, it's astounding where your mind will actually wander. And so much of songwriting is following where your thoughts are leading. So you're actually sitting there transcribing the journey that your thoughts are taking. That to me is totally is super important also if you're in a dry spell right you can refer back to your journal for renewed inspiration you know once you journal your pages etc you can highlight what you've written down great lines 
will pop out. Titles will pop out. Shards of an idea that you were thinking about might come back to you. And it becomes a resource. You're mining your own raw material and then you can use it for years, you know, especially for my students. Like they're like 19 to 21, write down. You're not going to remember any of this, right? I mean, so write it down, you know, write that stuff down. You're going to be using it for the rest of your lives. And yeah. there are some great stories about like the, the songs that have come out of those journals in, in the book. I'm going to go back again to my favorite band, Van Halen. Now, this is something that I remember sure. David Lee Roth being on uh, Joe Rogan, which was just uh, maybe last year. And Joe Rogan asked Dave about writing lyrics. He does just that, jots things down in a notepad. And yeah. he'll go back to something he may see on a billboard or something that somebody says in passing. You know, when was the, when was the last time you did something for the first time? Or right. the last album they did, 2012 is a different kind of truth, has a bunch of those Oh, yeah. yeah, that's it. But like you say, you go back and you may see something that you wrote down in a journal like three, four years ago. And then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, wait a minute, there's a song right there. Yeah. A lot of the thoughts that we have, I think, are also predictive. And I'm not being like spooky about it or whatever, but like you can think of things that you can admit at a certain time, but you just can't get to yet, you know? I think that happens in songwriting. Like you'll you'll be writing songs, or whatever, and then like a weird song will show up and you don't know what to do with it and then as you continue writing songs the rest of the songs that bridge where you are will arrive and, and it'll make sense at a later date that kind of stuff happens and it happens in journaling too how about um, this one this is when i'm just looking at the album that i just referred to a different kind of truth here's dave's mm -hmm. lyrics headless body in a topless bar <laughs> that's a new york post headline it is yes so that's where he got that from, I'm sure. Look, yes. Look up Headless Body in a Topless Bar. It is a New York Post headline, and it happened. <laughs> that's, that's something that actually happened. Headless Body in a Topless Bar, and that's a headline. And you know Dave lived yeah. in the city for a while, so yeah. he probably yeah, he did. The real story of Headless Body in Topless Bar. <laughs> yep. Oh, my God. Warring clans and lowered cars. A buck is still a buck in Shanghai, and a buck is all you earn. A great night for all concerned. <laughs> Hero a great night for all concerned is so him. Yeah. It, he's such an MC, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. he's just like, always is like the host. And to me, the California Girls video is like one of the great videos of all time. Because Absolutely. Of Classic. How he's, yeah. How he casts himself as like this tour guide through craziness. And like, that's basically his whole persona. Yeah. Right there. That song is Chinatown, by the way, where that lyric comes from. Okay, what about picking a specific object and writing about it for 10 minutes? Why 10 minutes? Writing for 10 minutes, it's a separate technique. And the technique is really good if you are in pressure type situations, right? If you're writing three pages a day or whatever, that's sort of a long jaunt through those pages. But if you're in a session and you are pressed for time and you have to get to something really salient in a short period of time that exercise helps you get there faster right and you can pick anything you can pick you know a bottle of ketchup or something and go 10 minutes and end up somewhere very very different and very deep when you're in a session getting the time constraints to work in your favor becomes really important you know you, you may be sitting in a session and there are co-writers sitting there and they need a line from you if you have been sprinting, doing these kind of 10-minute sprints, you'll be able to get somewhere faster. You'll be able to pull something out with greater speed and greater efficiency. You know, so one's like a long-distance run and one's a sprint. The Booked on Rock podcast will return after this. Time to check out the new and upcoming Books on Rock releases. Nothing But a Good Time by Justin Quirk just released today, December 17th, through Unbound Books. From 1983 until 1991, glam metal was the sound of American culture. This was the world stalked by hair metal bands like Bon Jovi, Kiss, Wasp, Skid Row, Dokken, Motley Crue, Cinderella, Rat, and many more. Armed with hairspray, spandex, and strangely shaped guitars, they marked the last great era of supersized bands. Another book released today, Yes, in the 1980s, Decades, by Stephen Lamb with David Watkinson, out on paperback through Sonic Bond Publishing. 
with most authors concentrating on the group's 1970s career, Yes in the 1980s looks in forensic detail at this relatively underexamined era of the band's history. Featuring rarely seen photos researched by author David Watkinson, this book follows the careers of all nine significant members of Yes during a turbulent decade that saw huge highs but also many lows. Two more new books released today, Radiohead, Every Album, Every Song by William Allen through Sonic Bond Publishing. This book examines each album and each peripheral song from singles, b-sides, and EPs with stories and analysis of every officially released track from arguably not only the most important rock group of the 1990s, but also the most significant post-rock group of the new century. And Led Zeppelin, Every Album, Every Song by Steve Pilkington through Sonic Bond Publishing. This book digs into every Led Zeppelin track recorded during their decade-long existence before John Bonham's death brought down the curtain by way of facts, anecdotes, analysis, and a small dose of humor here and there. Celebrating the triumphs and the arguable lower points, this is an alternative history of the band told via the most important element, the music itself, which has influenced so many down the years. The history of Led Zeppelin is a wild ride. This book shows you why. Due out December 28th, through Permuted Press, Unchained, The Eddie Van Halen Story by Paul Brannigan, the first full-length biography of Eddie Van Halen, a searching, affectionate, and in-depth look at the remarkable life of a genuine musical virtuoso who changed the course of rock and roll. Acclaimed biographer Paul Brannigan tackles the dramatic story with respect and affection for one of rock's greatest musicians, pairing original interviews with meticulous research to bring the story of Eddie Van Halen completely up to date. For a list of all the newest and upcoming books on rock releases, just head over to our website, booksonrock.com. Mike Errico's book, Music, Lyrics, and Life, a field guide for the advancing songwriter. It is out now. I want to go back to Springsteen for this next question because this mm. makes me think of Bruce. He often introduces his songs in concert with one, two, one, two, three, four. You write in your right. book about the number four and why are brains oh, sure. like that number? Can you talk about that? Why do we like the number yeah. four? Yeah. Most of our songs are in 4-4, four, four, which is to say the beats are four to the measure. And if you look at like, you know, whatever the pop charts, billboard charts, they're almost all in four. There are certain things that our brains love. And the number four is one of those things. Repetition is another thing that we love because it makes us feel smart. You know, we recognize the terrain when we hear things that repeat. Four is really interesting it may just be, you know, there are lots of theories on this, but one of the theories, of course, is that this is what we grew up with, right? So like our lullabies are in the West, our children's songs are, are all in four, you know, Jack and Joe went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. You know, th those are all, that's all in four. So that's one reason. They also talk about the possibility that we are bipeds. And that's a two. So we're, we're used to, in the womb, we're used to like the sound, the rhythm of two and four happening. Or we are, we are the offspring of bipedal mothers is another. These are all just theories. I, I, to me, it's probably just like in the West, we listen to things in four. Therefore, we think that four is the thing, is how to write a melody. That's how we listen. And that's also why artsier people will mess with four. A band like Radiohead will pull out of four and do something in five and seven or something like that where you can't find the one and you feel a little disoriented. But that's like Radiohead's whole thing is to feel a little disoriented, right? Because the future is a little disorienting and they are a little bit disorienting. And so they jerk us around a little bit by like taking four and pulling the rug out from under it. That makes perfect sense. Sticking with Bruce a little bit more here, he's written many what you call mission songs. What's a mission yeah. song? Well, the thing about, and Bruce is such a great example of this, but a mission song, basically, to differentiate yourself as a songwriter, you kind of have to teach the listener who you are, right? So having a mission song or a mission statement will help you do that. So say Eminem, we all know, is from Detroit. But the reason we know that is because he's told us a million times and he's written it in songs and he's taught us that. 
Springsteen, of course, is is Jersey, but he's done it a million times. He's taught us. It was greetings from Asbury Park, you know? And once you can understand an artist, you can join in with them. You can decide to join in with them, you know? So geography is a big part of identifying the artist and differentiating themselves from other artists. I don't know. What's a good... Well, New York bands, there's plenty. Jay-Z, we know where he's from. Kendrick Lamar, we know. You know, we know where they're, we know where these people are, are from because they told us over and over again. How about Bon Jovi but, calling their album New Jersey? It, absolutely. But they're doing it on purpose. They do that kind of stuff on purpose. And it doesn't have to be geography either. It can be all sorts of different types of things. It can be mission songs can display one's politics or their likes or dislikes or who they are as opposed to others. To me, one that's really great is Lord's song, Royals, because she just talks about, we will never be royals, right? And she creates a gang of people who now stand in opposition to royalty, which of course is basically everybody, right? So that song was a huge hit because I remember thinking to myself, well, I'll never be royal either. So Lord, me and you, we're like, you know, we're, in this, we're on the same team here, you know? So these these types of missions teach the listener how to understand the artist. So reverse engineering that, I tell my students, what are you about? Write it down. Tell them again and again and again. You know, where are you from either geographically or metaphorically? The other person I, I use is uh, Casey Musgraves. Her first album was Same Trailer, Different Park, which to me is like, an amazing way of saying, even though we're not from the same place, we're the same. We're pals. You know what I mean? Like, I love the generosity of that one. So I give out like a whole bunch of different types of mission songs. And I ask my students, like, you know, would this one work for you? Are you from Cleveland, Ohio or something? How about that? How about taking that? Or are you a man of constant sorrow? Or are you... <laughs> Uh, the sun in the air or are you like you know we're not going to take it or can you create like a war cry you got to fight for your right to party right or fight the power or something like that these become rallying cries that define you and that's what you want as a writer what about the importance of a song title in the sense of not so much to help identify or connect the listener with where that artist is from or who they are but what about just picking the right title. In other words, I just spoke with author Tony Thompson. He wrote a book on the doors and he was uh -huh. talking about the song touch me, which was a hit for the doors. It was intended to be called hit me. And we were wondering, kind of pondering if that would have made a difference chart wise. Like what if it was called hit me and not touch me? Would that make a difference? Well, two things about that. It's a directive, right? That's a mission. That's a type of mission. Touch me or hit me are both definitive action verbs, call to action, right? Hit me obviously is more confrontational and less sexy, I think. Right. <laughs> I mean, some people, some people may love that, but I think, I mean, you know, this is armchair quarterbacking, but like touch me is to me the better title because he was hot, right? So I think he was, that's kind of more like what, a segment of his fan base wanted to do anyway. Yeah. You know, but that can um, make a difference though. And that can make a big difference in whether a huge. song is going to hit the charts or not. I mean, there's the obvious huge. ones. If you, if you got some four letter word in the title and chances yeah. are, it's not going to go far, but, but just the more I, subtle ones sometimes, yeah. it's, maybe it's not so subtle. Well, it's a shingle that you hang outside the song. You know what I mean? It's the first thing you see a lot of times you'll get the title before you even get the song. So I do tell my students to, to try and make it stick out. Any opportunity to stick out. Does it matter if the song title is included in the lyrics or not? Because Led Zeppelin has been famous for having songs where the title is not at all mentioned in a song. Any importance to be placed on that? Does it matter? Well, I, this is a bias. What I hope for for my class is for my students to get a song that's going to push them into another tier, you know, and one way to do that is to make things somewhat recognizable. The easiest way to, to be recognizable 
is to have the title be the biggest part of the song and either the front or the back of the chorus, right? So the song I use is Since You've Been Gone by Kelly Clarkson. When someone asks, how does that song go? People go, since you've been gone, right? That's the title, makes it easier to find and is the biggest part of the hook. So, and it also begins and ends that chorus. So I, I personally always flag when my students are like, don't put the title in the song. And a lot of times they're like, go to hell, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is totally fine. I mean, you know, but I will say like, you know, I really want people to know how to find this song. And I really want people to be able to respond to it and sing along and join in, you know, and some students don't want that. They want a journey that's a little bit harder because the payoff will be greater. And Zeppelin is a little bit like that. Sure. But like, Bon Iver is like that, too. So having the title be in the song is easier, I think, for a listener to latch on to. But I do tell the students, like, you need to decide, like, where on the line of solvability you actually want to land. You might not want to be very solvable. You, you want to be a little bit opaque. You want to feel a little bit like a video game, you know, where you have to really, like, go into the closets and figure out the title may appear like an Easter egg, you know, in the middle of the second verse or in the bridge or something like that. And people are excited by that. But it really depends on what kind of song you're hoping to put across. My hope is that they're going to write Royals, you know, and then they can write all the crazy stuff. They can throw their guitars down the stairs. They can do anything they want after that. But I want them to plant a flag so that they can decide where they want to go from it from there. Let's talk about the song's opening lyric. How important is that first line in a song? It's kind of everything. I would say the first line of kind of anything is totally critical because you're you're deciding as a listener or a reader or a viewer whether or not you're going to invest in this. So like in like spy novels, you'll walk right in first page and there's going to be a death a gunfight, a, you know, an alien landing, something big is going to happen, right? Cop shows, you start with the murder, right? And then you go to the court scenes or whatever. Setting up an exciting way of spending one's time, you know, is part of that first line or that first scene or any beginning of the first part of a play or something. Because it's really about talking to the listener and being like, this is going to be worth it. Picture this. Picture yourself on a boat on a river. You know what I mean? Phenomenal first line. I quickly Googled an article on the greatest opening lines of all time. And mm -hmm. one consistency throughout is every single one of these, I know by heart like exactly what the song is, right? On a dark sure. desert highway, cool wind in my sure. hair, warm smell of Kalitas rising up through the air. Hotel right. California, know it right away. There's a cliche, show, don't tell, right? So one way the song sort of develops is that in the verse, you show something, right? So on a dark desert highway, the screen door slams, uh, you know, uh, on and on and on, like for these real classic bottle of red, bottle of white, you know. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to and talk with you again. Absolutely. You have absolutely set up something really weird. And you're like, huh. I'm sticking around. You want them to stick around, you know? So that first sort of line and that verse shows a scene. And then the chorus generally will tell or maybe interpret what's going on. So that's, that's like a sort of basic architecture for a song. And then you develop from there. But yeah, that first line has to be like kind of an explosion. Just a small know? town girl living in a lonely world. <laughs> Journey. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and those are those are epic. And we spend time on that first line. One thing that's interesting, I have to say, is TikTok and platforms and the way that people are listening to music make it so that the smart thing or, you know, the crafty, clever thing to do on those songs is to open with the chorus. Yeah. So like Stay by you know, Justin Bieber and Kid Leroy or whatever, these songs... There are several different songs in the top five or six or whatever that open with the chorus 
And what they're hoping for is for people to do TikTok dances to it and getting the, the most memorable part of the song up front at the top because there's no time to waste. You know, there's one that always comes to mind when I think about that. Eric Clapton's It's In The Way That You Use It. Mm-hmm. Right away. Boom. It's in mm-hmm. the way that you use it. Boom. Sure. Right there. And I always thought that sure. was interesting. Like, what what was their thought process as to that? Why did they decide to just go right in with that chorus? That's it. Because it's the stickiest part of the song. So don't let them wait. I mean, the real super cliche is don't bore us, get to the chorus. But if you start with the chorus that cliche has exploded and you don't have, you don't have to worry about it anymore. How about melody? That's another important ingredient to a song. You include an interlude in the book devoted to melodic math. What is melodic math and what are the five gems that come from melodic math? Melodic math is built on the concept that music in a lot of ways, I don't mean to sound like overly analytical, but like, it's counting without actually knowing that you're counting. There are ways that we're counting. And when we're counting and it acts equivalently, we're satisfied by it. So, for instance, if you set up a melody, a first initial melody line, if you're going to repeat that line, you repeat it exactly, right? No pickups, no little changes or doodads until later because you need to establish a pattern like a melodic pattern this is the kind of stuff that melodic math talks about another thing is that like if you're starting a verse you begin after the one of the first measure i don't want to get too far into it but like you start after the one and get a sort of conversational sort of feeling from that but if you then start your chorus before the one like since you've been gone you know that it starts before the one, then you get like a real urgency in your choruses. So if a student comes up to me with like a, a song that they're just like, oh, this is so boring. The first place I check is like, where do these sections start relative to the one? And are you using and contrasting these sections so that we're getting like, you know, we're getting a fun ride at the end of the day. Is it hard to get a hit single without good harmonies? Because we think about, we mentioned Simon and Garfunkel's song, uh, Lennon and McCartney, and it's the Bee Gees. Harmonies. How important is that to a hit song? Can you even have a hit song without having some type of harmony in there? It's really beautiful. The human voice is one of the few things that we have that's not like, I mean, there's autotune, whatever, but like we all have a voice and the empathy that we have with singing voices is really strong so when you have harmonies obviously you get it multiplied but i don't know if i this is true but adele is basically parked at number one with like basically it's a piano vocal Mm, yeah right i mean like she's just sitting there and it was easy on me i guess and i think it's a piano vocal and i've been pointing that out to students because they're always freaking out about like production and like is my production good enough and all this kind of thing if the song has an intent, then you can really do it, piano vocal, guitar vocal. And that kind of stuff is really exciting. And you can dress it up with production and such, harmonies, etc. But, like, you don't have to. Springsteen has had a lot of hits without harmonies. A lot. Born in the USA, and I'm thinking Dancing in the Dark. A lot. Yeah. Dylan, a lot. And it really has, it really depends on, like, I mean, those are much older. But, like, you know, Adele is right now. It depends on so many different things, you know. It really depends on like what works for you, but you can also think about the context. Like sometimes there's so much clutter on the dial that something really chill, just piano vocal, will cut right through it. Nora Jones did that. Out of nowhere, right? Here she comes and she's just like, never breaks a sweat. I love her. And that was a monster. Adele, absolute monster. And it, it, it does happen. We also really love the big candy songs. So obviously harmonies are a huge part of a hit song. Well, let's talk but, song inspiration. How, how about mm-hmm. John Fogarty once said he wrote songs while staring at a blank wall. Bob Seger says he tries to have a view of the woods when he's writing lyrics. Where do you wow. go? What do you do to try and find inspiration for a song and or lyrics? Well, where I go is, I mean... It, it can be 
it can be lots of different things. So, I mean, it's a, it's a journal and it's in, it starts in the, in the morning, early in the morning, cup of coffee kind of thing. But it's really what I think really works across all different sorts of writers is to find something through experimentation and then stick it like a ritual, you know? So if you love midnight with a snifter or brandy or like, you like to do it at noon with, uh, I don't know, milkshake or whatever. If you hit something ritualistically, I think that that is a, a way for inspiration to come. But, you know, it's different for everybody. Some people aren't inspired at all until someone calls them up and says, I need something from you in half an hour. You know what I mean? And the pressure of that, the phone call is the inspiration. Lighting the fire under one's behind can also be an inspiration. All right. Then we go to the other end of the scenario. When a song is finished, you received some great advice from someone who, somebody about knowing when to leave the party early. Yes. One of the great bits of advice on like when a song is over came from George Saunders, the writer, which was that ending is stopping without sucking. Right. That's a really good determining factor like once something starts sucking you need to add it until it no longer sucks and then that's how you know you're done and it is a lot like a party right so like an old timey kind of band leader guy i had a conversation with him and he was really like you know it is it's like a party like if things you know the keg is kicked and like people are starting to get loose and there's like there's a little bit more sweat on everybody's brow and I don't know, things start start getting maybe a little bit weird or a little bit hairy. That's a great time to leave. <laughs> you know, leave the party. And so that is the same sort of with I think with songs, you know, if like people start jamming and uh, people, you know, like and the idea of the song feels like it's reached a terminal point and everyone's still sort of hanging around, that might be a good time to at least fade. <laughs> if not end with a hard hit at the end. Well, you, you mentioned Pink Floyd's Animals. There are songs that go on for a long time. I mean, even Oh but, my god. But they had to be. Bob Dylan on his last album, we talked about him continuing to make new music and he put out that yeah. album Rough and Rowdy Ways is the new album. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. in there is the song Murder Most Foul about yeah. the assassination of JFK. Close to yeah. 17 minutes long. Yes. Yeah. It's funny there that plus like the get back documentary and other pieces of work. Sometimes the piece of work, the size of the work is also a stand in for the feeling of the work. I remember taking a class once and someone saying Moby Dick had to be as big as it is because it's about a whale. So it's got to feel like a whale. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> so like to me, like the Pink Floyd albums, are long as like a as a as a, a trip like a psychedelic trip or something like that because that's how long it takes you know that i i sort of enjoy that idea that the structure is actually sort of mirroring the intent of the song and i do think that it was a little bit like that with dylan's song also taylor swift came out with a 10 minute song not so long ago yeah and the get back documentary saying it's that big because like he wanted you to feel the tedium, you know what I mean? And, and what they were really going through. So you have to go through it with them. Yeah. So we know that, back in the early days, the early Beatles days, <clears throat> songs had to be two and a half, three minutes tops. Otherwise the radio station wasn't going to play it. I mean, absolute tops. Yeah. I mean, not even. Yeah. I mean, some of their songs are like, under two minutes crazy right incredible but like they got in they got out they the ending is stopping without sucking those songs do not suck they end too quickly to suck yeah i, I was <laughs> my mom and i were driving in the car we were heading to actually go see a, a great concert at her church christmas music it's beautiful you know? mm. but we were listening to some sinatra because this yesterday was sinatra's birthday so we said, nice. let's play some Sinatra Christmas stuff. And I noticed that each song, two and a half minutes, two yep. minutes, 40 seconds. Yeah. Then we went, yep. then we went to uh, uh, Johnny Mathis, two and a half yep. minutes, you know, maybe three. Yep. Yes. There were two, three minutes. And, and they also had sort of a little bit of a different song form. 
they're sort of like A, A, B, A is what it's called. So there's like a two section form, like somewhere over the rainbow. Great example. But like jazz standards. And the whole thing is a, just a different trip. It's like a, it's a melodic trip and you never feel like you're arriving somewhere. It's like the song starts and you're there already. And it, and it doesn't relent until it's over. You mentioned the AABA. I'm geeking mm-hmm. out on this stuff now. Genesis Abacab was that <laughs> that title came from just yeah. the way the song was spaced out. A B A C A B. Yeah. And they said, what the yeah. hell? Let's just call it Abacab. Yeah. I mean, that, that's true. And I love that song, Abacab. Oh, great. Actually, now, but, but what do those letters mean? What what are those all about? The A B C A B A C A B. Right. Well, the A would be the first section of a song. So like for if it if it's like yesterday, you would be like yesterday, all my troubles seem to f- so far away, etc. That's your A section, right? Starts and ends, by the way, with the title setting, right? A B section would be the next section. So why she had to go, I don't know what you would say. That's your B section. That song toggles back and forth between A and B all straight through. And that's it. There's no other. There's nothing else. So that's a two, and like jazz standards are like that, generally. And they came out of a tradition, you know, so that's the tradition, they, partially the, what they came out of, that and the Chuck Berry stuff. The Booked on Rock podcast will return after this. I'm sure you've discussed this topic in class, writer's block, the dreaded <laughs> writer's block. Even the greatest <laughs> songwriters get it. Sure. Sting had it for nearly a decade, beginning around 2003. Yeah. He said yeah. the songs were just flowing out of him for years and years. And we know he's written some sure. amazing music. He told NPR he got out of it by shifting the focus of the songs from himself to other people, putting himself in other shoes, giving a voice to someone else. You write in your sure. book that writer's block doesn't exist. It's really rooted yes. in fear. Was Sting yeah. afraid of stepping outside of himself? I can imagine. I mean, I, I don't know, but I can absolutely imagine the pressure on someone like him. Hey, you wrote Message in a Bottle. How about Message in a Bottle too? It's like John Popper, same. Mm-hmm. You know, and of course, everyone has their own way of dealing with it and like their perfectionist tendencies, perhaps. Or they're going to the same well, trying to find the same thing as opposed to changing the well. And Sting has done that. He did The Last Ship recently, the uh, Broadway show, which I heard was great. And he's tried lots of different things. So I feel like he might, that might be something, uh, a place where he had, where he had to go. The other thing is, I bet he wrote a ton during that quote unquote terrible time. And I bet the stuff was (laughs) I bet they were sting songs, to be honest. I bet they were, he he might not have liked them. But again, we've seen so many times that some people don't even know what's when they are at their best. You know, my wife certainly tells me when I'm at my best and I'm like, wow, I I had no idea. (laughs) You know, that's the other thing, too, is judging your own work is that can be dangerous. Nah, this is good. And then everybody else says, this is the greatest song you've ever written. Right. right. Yeah. And I bet there's I bet there's some gems in that sting time period. Although I bet he would never admit that or agree. You know what I mean? Yep. Mike Erico's book, Music, Lyrics, and Life, a field guide for the advancing songwriter. It is out now. And we did talk about that Beatles Get Back documentary. Oh yeah. This is just an amazing up close look at the songwriting and the recording process of John Paul George and Ringo in nineteen seventy. I can't think of a better band to talk about in terms of songwriting, really. What what comes to mind when you think about each of those? Well, John, Paul, and George, primarily. So those three guys, how different are they? How similar are they as songwriters, in your opinion, from what you've listened to over the years and and what you've seen in that documentary? It's so hard because by the time you're at that documentary, they're down the road a bit. And first off, like George is having a tough go. Right. He leaves the band. I mean, for one thing, but he's also like trying to introduce great songs into. (laughs) And if he were in some other band, he would have been the lead writer. The other thing that really was very sad was like how the work was being hindered by the lack of Brian Epstein being around. Like he says a couple of things like dad's not here to tell us like how to make this this work. And I think John's high for a lot of it, right? Yeah. Certainly the the first episode, he's pretty high. And he's messing, you know, he's messing around 
And he's like, and he's saying, he said to the camera a few times, he's like, well, you know, I'll, it'll come around. Like things will get tighter and tighter. And then that's when I show up. And I kind of feel like that happened. And, you know, he warmed up to the whole thing. And he kept Paul on the rock side of things, which is really cool. Like Paul could have been like, uh, I don't know. He could have gone uh, into like Maxwell Silverhammer and all of that. And Lennon was like, we're a rock band, dude. You know what I mean? So they got really great both sides going on. They have great interplay between the two of them. Not to be forgotten, George brings in Billy Preston. So that's like bananas. So it's not like he was pushed off to the side. He made amazing contributions. I mean, incredible. To break down the Lennon-McCartney songwriting partnership in the simplest terms, you you often will hear like Lennon was the salt and McCartney was the sweet. How, how would you define that songwriting chemistry between them? In like a shorthand, I feel like that's kind of right. I mean, I, I, I feel like there there is a, a lot to that. Paul's like melodic gifts are just incredible. And what the types of things that the type, the ways that John continues to undercut them with like snark and, and weird voices and like distorted guitar uh, lines and stuff like that. It's just, it's incredible to watch. And especially because we know where these songs are going to end up, but they don't yet. So it's really a treat to watch, you know, to watch where they're going. What do you think about George as a songwriter after he left the Beatles? What type Amazing. of a di different songwriter than those two guys? I mean, what lyrically, musically, what what do you pick Amazing. up on when you? Yeah, he he was amazing. Now, what he a little dark, a little bit a little darker. A little darker. All things must pass is like among the best of the the solo stuff that any of those guys put out, to be sure. And th not to be forgotten, he was a Wilbury. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's so he had a whole other world and a whole other life with those guys. And I mean, I feel like that speaks a lot to the respect that he got from his peers and what he probably was like to hang out with. Cause those guys didn't have to hang out with people they didn't want to hang out with. And they picked George. That's cool. I love cloud nine from 87. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. He's great. No. And like the George songs are great. What, in, in the Beatles. What about those collaborations, which I find fascinating, which are Jerry Garcia and Robert Hunter? Okay, because then you, there you got Jerry writing the music and Robert writing the lyrics. And which came first? There's this amazing story, and you may have read about this one, the song Terrapin Station from Grateful yeah. Dead, right? And Robert, one night in a single sitting, lightning storm crackles across San Francisco. At that moment, Jerry's driving across the Richmond San Rafael bridge gets an idea for a ballad, hurries home, captures that melody. And Robert the next day calls him and says, Hey, I I've got some great lyrics. I was watching that lightning storm and I wrote down these lyrics and Jerry's like, Hey, I was watching the same thing. And I came up with music to it. I mean, it's like at the same time, like they're sharing the same brain. They, 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 right. they were both writing one, writing lyrics, one writing music to that same lightning storm at the same time i mean that is yeah. to me fascinating there's not yeah. there aren't many songwriting partnerships like that yeah well that's again like that synchronicity thing that we were talking about before where it's just like you can call it coincidence if you like but like that's a little bit weirder than coincidence right <laughs> yeah there, you know but it's not explainable i mean i i, I you know and i'm not you know claiming supernatural forces or anything but like that stuff happens uh, but why don't more well i don't know maybe there are more musicians that i'm aware of that have lyricists but why don't more of these musicians seek out lyricists well there are some you know famously elton john uh, oh yeah bernie taupin you, yeah you did go. something yeah uh, he was one, and I do think Trey Anastasia didn't. Didn't they have a lyricist as well? I would have to look that up. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not totally sure. But it's hard. Uh, it's hard to be a musician and sing somebody else's lyrics. Yes, unless and, they're dead on. Unless they're yes. right in tune with you. Yeah. Some of the people I interviewed in the book talk about that. They split up songwriting credit in a way that the lead singer has full control of the lyrics because they're the one 
that has to sell it vocally. So they're like, I, I have to be able to sing my own words. Sorry. <laughs> Bass parts, all you, but I get the lyrics. Why do songwriting partnerships, the most legendary ones, why don't they last? Lennon McCartney, Steven Tyler and Joe Perry of Aerosmith, uh, Simon and Garfunkel, they have their fallouts. Why is it that most musical partnerships aren't as harmonious as the music they make? I think that really speaks to a lot of the pressure of the industry and and success and the, and the songwriting. And also, I don't know, why do marriages not last? You know, a lot of marriages don't last. <laughs> you know, right, right. like uh, then people grow apart. People get tired of Aerosmith songs, I guess, you know, or, or Steven Tyler went to uh, Desmond Child, right? Didn't he? He did for a yeah. um, permanent dude vacation. Looks like a lady. Yeah, Dude Looks Like a Lady, permanent vacation yeah. album. Yeah. yeah. You talked earlier about the business side and making sure that your students don't get too caught up in all of all of that. And this leads to the topic of publishing and who gets credit yes. on a song. And that's huge when it comes to yes. financial payoff. This classic story with the animals is one that yes. stands out where the House of the Rising Sun, it's credited to their organist, Alan Price. And the reason is that the record company told the other guys in the band, well, there, there wasn't enough room on the 45. So we just we just went with Alan Price because... His name's Alan. It's letter A. He just he came first alphabetically, so he gets the royalties. I mean, that's insane, right? Um, it's completely insane. So, what suggestions do you have for songwriters when it comes to the business side of songwriting and publishing? Right. The first, I guess, bit of advice or whatever is to decide on what they call splits, right? This, how how your song is split up. So, generally, two people in a room. The smart idea is that the song will be split 50-50, regardless who does what. And that's a big Nashville thing as well. I spoke to Shane McAnally, who has written many hits with Casey Musgraves and with Sam Hunt and with a bunch of others. He's like, when we have two people in a room, 50-50. I might do 80% of a song and you may do 20, but like, you know what? Tomorrow may be the other way around and it's more important to keep our relationship happy and be chill with everybody and think about the next song more than parsing, you know, bits and pieces of, of songwriting credit. That's really the first and most important thing. Like walk in knowing what the split is going to be. Sometimes that's hard to do, but it's a people business. And so even if you feel like it's, you know, your split is wrong, being a jerk about it gets you disinvited to the next song, <laughs> you know? So sometimes you just have, sometimes you have to swallow it. You have, you have to swallow the fact that you're not getting exactly what you think because you're thinking long-term, you know, and you're thinking about the network and the community that you're building. The best story regarding this is queen and how they all had it mapped out with each album. Freddie gets, I'm trying to remember mm. what the breakdown was, but Freddie gets three or four songs. Brian May gets two. Mm. Roger Taylor gets two. John Deacon gets two. That was working together. But there are bands that in the beginning, they say, just share it four ways because that's going to keep us together. But yep. guess what? Resentment, right? Down the line, the guy who wrote the most of the song is saying, well, what the hell's he? He's got himself a nice new house and a nice car. Yep. And he didn't do yep. a thing. He just showed up. Yep. And, right. So there's got to be some I kind of. Yeah, agreement earlier. Well, John Fogarty had that with Creedence Clearwater Revival. That was crazy. That was a huge issue. Huge. Yeah, that was crazy. One of the split breakdowns that I thought was so interesting was Charlie Bliss. They are a Connecticut-based pop punk band, and they decided that publishing-wise, there are four people in the band, even split, twenty-five percent all the way around, no but, matter what. No matter what. But the writing side of it would be dependent upon who put in the most for that particular song, right? So if somebody walks in having written the entire song, say, that person would get 100% of the songwriting and everybody would split the publishing. 
so that the writer is being credited, but also the band is being credited for the contributions that they're making to the rest of the song, the arrangement, the playing of it, the promotion of it, et cetera. How about the police song, Every Breath You Take, where Sting gets sole songwriting credit on that, and Andy Summers, mm. the guitarist, got pretty pissed off because P. Diddy sampled it, and yeah. Andy Summers gets nothing. Yeah, that's hard to swallow. We'll wind this down with a few more questions for you, Mike. This is fascinating. I could talk to you all night about this stuff. I, lo I love this. Mm -hmm. um, That's great. So, but I want to throw out some of my personal favorite artists. And we did talk about a few already here. But I want to give you an artist or a band. And you just tell me the first thing that comes to mind in terms of songwriting, you know, how they are songwriters. So let's start with my favorite band, Van Halen. There are two versions. You got the Dave years and the Sammy years. Van yeah. Halen as, as a songwriting team, Eddie and Dave, Eddie and Sammy. What comes to mind when you think about them? Mostly Eddie. <laughs> but uh, their style and their aesthetic was really what drove them. Some of the, the uh, David Lee Roth songs, I think, stand taller. But I do think that Sammy Hagar like, really had like a craft his writing it's a different style i personally feel like the david lee roth eddie songs feel a little bit more like eddie's playing and that they're a little bit more off the cuff and a little bit like you don't really know where things are going to end up you know there are more surprises i think well you know what his the, famous saying was my music is like falling down the stairs and landing on your feet absolutely i love that and i love that about dave I mean, I, I love that about Eddie. Like, I feel like some of his guitar solos, and thank God for YouTube, you know, like, because YouTube, they get like these guitar, they just get just the guitar part, you the know, song just stems. like, yeah, just the stems and the isolated guitar parts. I, I mean, that guitar is like out of tune, messed up, strings are like breaking, and like, you can hear it all, you know, and it's, that is so exciting. His playing is so exciting for that. And the fact that they left that stuff in, I don't think you could have done that in that Hagar and in the later years where it's like real pop rock, you know, if they would have taken it until they get it right. And like all this kind of thing. I just feel like it feels like jazz a little bit more with David Lee Roth. Interesting. All right. What about you interviewed Paul Stanley for this book? What about Kiss from a songwriting perspective? Getting Paul on the phone, he's maybe the nicest guy I've ever talked to, which was incredible. That's cool. Um, he was also like, you know, we were really influenced by 60s soul. And I think he did a soul record recently, he didn't sure he? sure did. Yeah, Soul yeah. Station. Yeah. So like he was talking about like breaking some of their songs down, like Shout It Out Loud or whatever. And like Shout It Out Loud was a lot like Shout, Sam and Dave. Yeah. Right. And he talks about like the, the hand clapping bits in the in the middle and stuff like that were inspired by soul music. So he was really a student of this kind of stuff, but they just, they needed to find their own way of interpreting it. And songs like I Want to Rock and Roll All Night, which is a mission song to bring it back to what we were talking about, is inspired by I Want to Take You Higher. Right. By Sly and the Family Stone. And that was another one where the. A&R person was like, we need a mission statement song. We need a manifesto like Sly and the Family Stone has, I want to take you higher. And so Paul was just like, you know what? We love Sly. I saw Sly open for Hendrix and so much changed because of him. And then we just were like, okay, well, what's our mission? They want to take you higher. What do we want to do? We want to rock and roll all night and party every day which is where and that's where the song came from but he was very much into soul music and like he really wanted me to know that and it was really cool to hear it coming from him and you teach his son paul's son he's your i son. did you did teach his son what's his son's name yeah. again? evan evan stanley yeah and you say he's his son's a legit musician he's huh? yep he's great he's a great player super nice guy i didn't even i didn't know who he was and like, I remember one day he was like, I can't, um, I can't get be in class next week. I'm sorry. And I was like, why? And he, and he said, I'm, I'm going on a cruise on a kiss cruise with my dad. The kiss cruise. Yeah. Right. And I was like, 
Oh, that's cool. I did, that's kind of cool that you went on that you're going on a cruise with your dad to see Kiss. I didn't I didn't make the connection. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's just a kid with his dad going on a Kiss cruise. And then like finally someone was like, uh, oh, dude, um, his dad is in the band. <laughs> you know? I was wow. like, oh, oh. Ah, I didn't. Uh, yeah, Stanley, I see that now. Oops. That <laughs> is awesome. All right, yeah, it was really funny. Let's throw a few. I'm going to throw a few more classic rockers out there, and then just two of my f- favorite new, newer artists. But ACDC, my favorite band. Really? Oh yeah. Cool. Okay. Normally, bands will get. They won't last long if they're writing the quote unquote same song over and over again. Which that I don't think that is the case with ACDC, but I see what they're saying. It's got, it's <laughs> totally. got, it's got that. I hate to say formula, but these songs are so infectious. Bulletproof. Yeah, bulletproof. What makes ACDC such a great band songwriting wise? For me, the fact that they never really moved and there's no like acoustic song or whatever is like their greatest strength. I I can go to them for one thing. And they deliver like monsters. Obviously, Angus is amazing, but like Malcolm is amazing. And it's the rhythm section, you know, and it's what they were listening to. Again, it's like another Chuck Berry thing. If you listen to Angus, I mean, he's very influenced by Chuck Berry's guitar playing. But Bon Scott, his lyrics are hilarious. He's really funny and like body and kind of like it's just it's just really creepy and just funny, you know, like. I really enjoyed that. And also they're just relentless. They're just relentless. Like a machine. There's just, they're an absolute machine. And Malcolm is really the engine of that machine. I mean, he's just like, I don't know what it is like that guitar. Maybe he's like a tiny bit on top of the beat. And so it gives it like an urgency or something, but like, God damn, like there's just no, there's no, there's like a string of song of, of albums of theirs that are just kind of, to me, untouchable. Malcolm, rest in peace. Uh, he was the secret weapon because he wrote, oh. he wrote a bulk of those songs. In fact, right up until this very last album that they put out were songs that he wrote. Mm-hmm. All right. How about we did talk about them already, but just as a whole, Pink Floyd, particularly during the post Sid Barrett years, talk about yeah. the songwriting magic of Roger Waters, David Gilmour. They kind of just made this post psychedelic world right and they they were also like i mean they're after the beatles but they're using abbey road studios and they're using the same bank of sound effects right it's like all the clocks and all the craziness that were on like dark side of the moon like that stuff that you know was available to the beatles if they didn't actually even use that they have hooks and songs like that but they were definitely moving into something completely different also radio was moving somewhere different they had that was like the era of like the super long song right there was like bat out of hell they're stare to heaven they're everyone had like a really long song you know like there was more tolerance for like this kind of journey this musical journey that was going on and they did it so well and again i just have to say david gilmore as a guitar player just forget it It it's just he's just the greatest so lyrical right i mean like you can go on tiktok and like all like the 15 year olds are playing comfortably numb you know i mean they're, they're still playing like those epic solos with this because they're so singable you know but to me my personal opinion is dark side of the moon is is the greatest album of all time i yeah the music itself is just so dreamy and it's gorgeous and and it's so alluring and i, I it, it just envelops you but then you talk about the importance of lyrics and opening lines and things like that. You've got lines like, I mean, every single song on this album, the lyrics are something that everybody can relate to. I'm thinking about the song Time when he says, ticking away the moments that make up a dull day. Yeah. I mean, the sun is the same in a relative way, but you're older, shorter of breath, and one day closer to death. And these were all things that Roger Waters talked about, how he wanted to simplify the lyrics more. And that's not a bad thing, right? You can sometimes get a little too deep, a little too complex, and you can lose yeah. people. With these lyrics, everybody can relate to money, time, feeling like you're losing your mind. And it was a reaction, of course, to Sid Barrett, right? Mm-hmm. Was, there was a lot of Sid Barrett in it. So again, like the songs had a feel that was a little insane. There's a lot of Sid in the arranging. 
Every year is getting shorter. Never seem to find the time. One last classic rock artist. I have a, a zillion that I love, but just one more. You too. They're really interesting. They're, I feel like their style is intended for the largest audience possible. Everything sounds like Bono is like on the barricade rallying the troops or something. You know what I mean? It's like one anthem after another, after another, like it's just, inc- their stuff is epic, right? Even quiet stuff has a real epic quality to it. And I just feel like they knew they were not going to be playing small rooms. And so they, they wrote to fill giant rooms. Even the, I mean, the early stuff, in particular, I will follow and all that kind of stuff, just like huge, just epic, huge things. And, and the- he was also really, really another one of those real curious, real driving type people like Octane Baby and, and that kind of stuff was like, it was a switch for them. And it paid off huge, but like, it was a, it was a chance. They took a shot, you know? There is that identifiable sound too from The Edge and his guitar. Crazy. That's important. And too. that was a whole other look at the guitar. Like that was, he's not the big solo guy, but he was filling up giant spaces with, with the guitar. Well, you know, another, another band that wrote specifically for arenas and stadiums, Def Leppard, another one of my favorite bands. (laughs) Crazy. (laughs) Yeah. Hysteria, hysteria, but here, okay. So here are two, I'm just gonna throw two bands out there that are new or newer Kings of Leon. It's been around for a while, but they're newer Kings of Leon. And then I, I love Lord Huron. Are you a fan of either or both? Well, yes. I mean, I've seen Kings of Leon a couple times. Really fun. Sex on Fire. That's like, to me, the one where they rang the bell. You know what I mean? There's like a real ring, ring the bell song for them. Distinct singing voice. Stands out. Unique. Yes. What about Lord Huron? How much have you heard of them? I don't know much of their stuff, but I don't know. I mean, I, I can't say I know enough about them to to really speak to them. Give them a listen if you can. You just I love. I yeah. discovered them by hearing their music in a movie. A That's ra- great. Just in a random movie with Robert Redford and Nick Nolte, where they were travel. They went on some hiking adventure, and the movie just kind of came and went pretty quickly. But I was like, what What are these songs that I'm hearing? Yeah, folksy, very folky, and um, yeah, you know, I think of. Dawes, the band. Yeah. Do you know Dawes? Yep. Yeah. Last thing we're going to ask you here is dealing with bad reviews. You write, there's a hundred percent chance that not everyone will love your work. It is inevitable and it sucks. What can I yeah. tell you? Sticking your neck out is brave and knives are cheap. Should we ignore negative reviews or read them? You know, it's so funny to me. Like the answer, if there is an answer is whatever gets the next song done. There was a great story of Michael Jordan where someone was like, you're the greatest basketball player in the world. Why do you even play like in a normal, on a normal game? And he's like, I read my reviews. I read and I look for someone to say something snarky about me. And that motivates me for the day. You know, so like, oh, Michael Jordan might be over the hill. He's like, and he, and I, I'm sure LeBron does the same thing. Right. And they find those reviews motivating. Another way to go is like, d- just don't even bother, you know, but if that gets you, if it's going to get in your head and mess you up, then they are of no use to you. W- what I propose is sort of a third thing, which is to read them until they have lost their power. Right. And usually they do, because if you really, <laughs> if you read a review, oftentimes the review is more a reflection of the reviewer than whatever they're listening to. So I read them until if, and if it's bad, I mean, I just, I just read them until like I can see the reviewer and I can see why the reviewer would talk about this. And that is of no value to me at all. Right. Cause I just have to get to the next thing. That is interesting. So just, yeah, just read it and read it and read it until you get to the point where it just means nothing. Yeah. I mean, it's the plague of eternal tedium, basically. The example I use is basically a an ex-girlfriend who's going to tell you all the ways you screwed up the relationship. And you can listen all you want, but 
it's better <laughs> after a while you realize that she's just talking to herself and what really has to happen is that everyone's got to move on so whatever helps you move on is the thing to do i just try to get my students in like that sort of head and to make stuff don't bother if it's good or not finish it you have the rest of your life to figure out whether or not it's good and you're going to say it's good for five years and then bad for five and it's going to go in and out like that don't worry about it just make stuff we're all going to die very soon <laughs> you know and i do tell them that i'm like you know we're not we're not here for that long so you can hem and haw or you can make stuff you know you can listen to the other reviews or you can make stuff that's what i want them to do that's great advice and you can, absolutely it's great advice and you can also you can have a sense of humor about it like angus young he says i'm sick to death of people saying we've made 11 albums that sound exactly the same in fact we've made 12 albums that sound exactly the same <laughs> that's the greatest we love you, Angus. And they're we love all you. great. And yeah. they're all, I, I, I just love them. <laughs> Angus. Yeah. This was fascinating. I, like, I told you before we started recording, I said I couldn't wait to talk to you about this stuff only yeah. because, you know, I, I am always fascinated with the people that can do things that I just can't. And that's why I think I, 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 hear you. I love music so much just because it's, it's like these people are just larger than life. They're like superheroes to me sometimes because it's like, how do you write that, you know? Music, Lyrics, and Life, A Field Guide for the Advancing Songwriter. It is out now through Backbeat Books. It's available wherever books are sold. Is there a specific website that you want fans to go to to get a copy, or is it just the usual outlets? I mean, I always put up a link to the Backbeat Books site, if, you, if that's best. Well, I mean, the Backbeat Books site is great. I love when people buy it locally. So I do have – I have. well, first of all, I have a Bandcamp page okay. where I sign – and we'll personalize and sign copies and I can send you that, that link, but Please it's just do. Mike Errico. What I tell people is the first place to go is your local bookstore, wherever that is. The second place would be my local bookstore, which is called books are magic. And that's in Brooklyn, New York. And the third is my, my band camp page. It's just Mike dot And yeah. I love that you met. This is like the second straight week that the guest has, talked about the importance of local bookstores. I have a link in not only the show notes page for each episode, but on my website yeah. to find your local bookstore. Buy it there. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I would have, I would have said bookshop.org, which is another great place because they kick back to local bookstores, but it's sold out there. The book is now in its second printing. It's been out for three weeks and it's already in a second printing. So it makes me nervous. <laughs> to, I, I don't, I don't use bookshop. I mean, of course there's Amazon, obviously. You know, we all know we all know that. But I think you make a, a difference in your own local community if you if you buy locally. Absolutely. Now, social media pages. Do you have any you want to get out there for people to sure to? at Mike Erico on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, all of those. It's all the same. Cool, Mike. Yeah. Thanks so much, man. Congratulations on the book. It's it's a great read, and I think that anybody who's a song uh, an aspiring songwriter, somebody who's already gotten to songwriting and even somebody like myself who's not a songwriter is just fascinated with how these songs are created yeah. it's worth the read for sure thank you so much thanks to mike erico for taking us through his book music lyrics and life a field guide for the advancing songwriter if you haven't yet subscribe to booked on rock at spreaker or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts we're on amazon music apple podcasts iHeartRadio, spotify tune in youtube and more Find us online at bookedonrock.com, on Facebook at facebook.com slash bookedonrockpodcast, on Twitter at bookedonrock. The email address is thebookedonrockpodcast at gmail.com. I'm Eric Senich. Thanks for listening. And join me again next time for another brand new episode of Booked on Rock. <laughs>